made a lot of progress on, and I am hopeful that we can get finished. Uh, many of our colleagues have been down here and have reminded all of us, quite rightly, of the terrible difficulties that many Americans are facing. We are not in a full-blown financial crisis anymore, but we're experiencing a lot of economic hardship. It tends to be concentrated in certain sectors and industries, and we have a full-blown health care crisis. So it's a very, very serious moment, and it demands a response. I am hoping we can get that done as soon as possible. And I want to discuss one of the uh, terms that I have advocated for in this legislation. Uh, the terms I've advocated for have been mischaracterized, including by the Senate Minority Leader and others. And so I want to set the record straight on what this is all about and why I think this is so important. And to do that, I think it's worth remembering what brought us to this point. Back in March, when the coronavirus was first ripping across America and wreaking so much havoc, the response in many, many places was a complete economic shutdown, a complete prohibition against doing business, against going to work, against earning a lifetime, earning a livelihood. And I understand why that was done. That we were in a health care crisis, and that was the response that was believed to be most likely to prevent an overwhelming of our health care capabilities that would have been absolutely horrific. And so we had this economic disaster, and what we discovered in March was this shutdown brought us to the brink of a financial crisis as well. If you think about the financial markets where people are providing capital to businesses and municipalities and individuals, they only do that if there is some confidence that they know, at least generally speaking, what the future looks like. We'd never seen anything like the government shutting down our economy before. And so not really shockingly, the financial markets were on the verge of completely freezing up, shutting down and preventing even the most basic functioning of our economy. I mean, businesses might, we might well have gotten to the point where a business couldn't go to its bank and borrow the money it needs to make payroll on Friday. Or they, they, they couldn't issue the bond that they need to do to pay off another bond that's coming due, and so that would put them in default and force them into bankruptcy and require them to lay everyone off. I mean, the knock-on effects would have been devastating had our financial system completely frozen up. And Mr. President, it was on the verge, some would say it was actually in the process of freezing up. And so that's why the Treasury Secretary and the Federal Reserve Board Governor came to Congress and said, look, we need some extraordinary, unprecedented new facilities that we can stand up very, very quickly, and we can use them to be a backstop, to restore confidence, and to enable private credit to start flowing again. So that this economic recession that we're certainly going to go through, back in March it was clear that was going to happen, but it was not clear that we had to suffer through a financial crisis that would create a depression. That was something we thought maybe we can avoid. So these facilities were set up, as I say, to restore the normal functioning of private lending and private capital markets. Not to replace those markets, not to pick winners and losers and decide, well, who gets credit and who doesn't, depending on whether we like their business. Not to subsidize, not to say, well, look, you know, let's just give cut rate loans to the people we like to give them to. None, none of that was the intention. None of that was the purpose. The purpose was to ensure that credit worthy borrowers could access credit through the normal channels. That was it. That was the purpose of what has been, what's widely described as the 13-3 lending facilities. There were several of these facilities. That was the intention for these facilities. And guess what? They worked. They worked amazingly well, remarkably well. Within days, certainly weeks, markets were again functioning, credit was flowing. As a matter of fact, within a, a matter of months, we were, credit was flowing at an all-time record pace. Corporate bond issuance hit an all-time record high across the credit quality spectrum, uh, municipal bond issues, all-time record high. Borrowers, businesses that wanted to 
keep their workers and continue to survive until we got past this COVID crisis, that they were able to draw down lines of credit from their banks. It worked. The creation of these facilities gave the confidence to our financial markets that restored the normal functioning of those markets. It was really quite extraordinary. Now, that, that doesn't mean that the economy got perfect after that. Certainly not. The economy is not perfect today. But it meant that a recovery would be possible. We'd be able to function. We'd be able to begin to pick up the pieces of a closed economy. And sure enough, we've made tremendous progress. More than half of all the people who lost their jobs are back at work. So that's not anywhere near where we need to end up, but we're on the right track, in part because these facilities did exactly what they were designed to do. Now, what does my language in this bill does? What my language does is it puts an end to these three programs that did their job, they functioned, they restored the private credit markets, and so they don't need to continue. What are these three programs? There's a corporate bond credit facility, there's a Main Street lending program, and there's a municipal lending program. Actually, they were hardly used at all. So quickly did the normal private credit markets resume their normal functioning that very few borrowers took advantage of In fact, I'm pretty sure in the corporate market, uh, the, I should say the corporate credit facility that was set up under these 13-3 facilities, I don't think anything was done at all. In the Main Street lending, it was very little. Municipal lending, there were two borrowers. That's it. These are the programs that were funded by the CARES Act, were set up at the time of the CARES Act for this narrow specific purpose, and now they've achieved their purpose. By the way, there's lots of other programs that have been set up over time, some were set up recently, that my legislation doesn't touch in any way, shape, form, or fashion. The commercial paper funding facility, unaffected. Money market fund liquidity uh, provision, un unaffected. The paycheck protection program, primary dealer uh, liquidity facility, untouched. All of them untouched. And quite contrary to what some have suggested, this is no big rewrite of the Fed's 13-3 lending facilities. It couldn't be further from that. What it is, is an acknowledgement that the three programs we created in March, and which, by the way, we put an expiration date on them in March. We said they end on December 31st. But now we have folks on the other side of the aisle who have a novel interpretation of the statute saying, oh, well, they don't really have to end. Or if they do end, we could bring them back to life. But we shouldn't even be having this conversation. But, but we are because we've got this interpretation that we have to deal with. What my statute simply, what my, my language simply does is it follows the statute and calls for the, the end of this. How do we do this? There's three steps. One is we rescind the money that never got used because, as I said, the markets res responded so quickly we never, never needed to use this money. And I think our Democratic colleagues agree on, on this provision. The legislation, my language, that I'm trying to uh, get in this package reiterates that these CARES facilities end on December 31st, as Congress intended. No, no, you know, I was in the room when we were writing this bill, and there's, nobody thought that any of these programs were going to last beyond the end of the year. But, as I say, because of this novel legal interpretation, we need to reiterate in an unambiguous way that they end on December 31st, as Congress intended. And, finally, we ensure that they can't be simply restarted next year or sometime thereafter, or duplicated without congressional consent. Now, we have folks on the other side of the aisle who are raising all kinds of objections. They're very upset about this. And it's fair to ask, why, why would that be? Well, it certainly isn't because the credit markets are back in turmoil and they think we need to restore the flow of private credit. That would be ridiculous. The credit markets are functioning as well or better than they ever have. It's, it's not, even, not even a close call. So it's not that. No, what it is is something very different, Mr. Chairman, and that is the problem that, that 
some of my colleagues want to morph these facilities into a use that was never intended for them. They want to convert them away from this temporary emergency liquidity facilities designed to stabilize markets and restore the flow of credit to convert it away from that and instead to use them to implement fiscal policy and maybe social policy and certainly to allocate credit based on their political preferences. What, what is one of the ways that um, our Democratic colleagues would like to do that? One, they want to bail out irresponsible states. Now look, I get that there are some states across the Union that have suffered financially because of COVID. There's other states that haven't been harmed at all. In fact, they've got more revenue coming in this year than they had last year. It varies, and there's definitely a category of state and municipalities that have suffered a loss of revenue. And we can and should have an ongoing debate in this body about what to do about that, if anything. But that's our responsibility. If we are going to send money to states and municipalities, we should have a bill, appropriate the funds, and have a vote in Congress so that the American people can hold us accountable. See, that's what happens. We get held accountable. And so when an action like that is done through legislation, it's out in the open, it's transparent, it happens in the light of day, and the American people know who to hold accountable. That's not what our Democratic colleagues want to do. They want to force the Fed to do this for them. And how do we know that? Because they passed a bill called the HEROES Act, H.R. 6800, that instructs the Federal Reserve to use the municipal facility for exactly this purpose super long-term, ultra-low-cost loans to municipalities, up to 10 years, at one quarter of 1% interest rates. And states wouldn't even have to attest that they couldn't secure ordinary credit. They could just show up and get it. So, so the Fed wouldn't be playing its role, its traditional role, as the lender of last resort in a financial crisis. It'd be the lender of first resort to their preferred constituency. There's the Main Street Lending Facility. If they could replicate that, who knows what kind of conditions they would impose on low interest loans there, whether it's climate or other policies that ought to be debated on this floor and ought to be determined through an accountable process. So as I say, none of this is speculative. Our Democratic colleagues have talked about this. They passed a bill that actually does this. It's, it's ironic that when we were developing the response to the financial cri to the crisis of, uh, of, of March of earlier this year, some of our colleagues described this $500 billion fund that was intended to capitalize these vehicles that would, would lend uh, and restore liquidity. They called it a slush fund. One of many examples, Senator Warren, on March 30th of 2020, said the CARES Act created, and I quote, a half trillion dollar slush fund that Trump administration could use to help its political friends and punish its political enemies, and I think that's a bad thing, end quote. Well, now there's a new administration, and now they want to keep the slush fund. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to complete my remarks before the vote. Without objection. Thank you. So this is a very bad idea for many reasons, not the least of which is to put the Fed in this position of being pressured to make these, these giveaway transactions based on a political pressure would completely politicize the Fed. It'd be the end of independence of the Fed. And this is, this is why this has never been the role of, of our central bank, the Fed. We've never asked the Fed to engage in fiscal policy or promote social policy or to allocate credit based on political standing. That's guaranteed to politicize the Fed and undermine Fed independence. Fiscal and social policy is the rightful realm of the people who are accountable to the American people, and that's us, that's Congress. 
I want to address another accusation that's completely false and totally unjustified, and that is that somehow this is an effort to hamstring the Biden administration and prevent them from doing what they want to do. Uh, let me assure you, Mr. President and my colleagues, my efforts to ensure that this would be a temporary facility began when we began discussing the facility. It was in March that I was arguing, actually I, I argued that we should have this end as soon as the financial markets had restored their normal functioning and no later than September 30th. I didn't win the argument. We ended up settling on December 31st. But that's when I started pushing to have a finite period of time and a short period of time. There was nobody in the room who thought that this was supposed to go on indefinitely. And once we started working on another COVID-related bill, started in the summertime, and I became aware of this alternative interpretation of the language, we put it in our bill and we voted on that in September. So this language, or the substantively similar language, has been uh, public for many, many months now. I also want to stress that we're not making permanent changes to laws and Congress can always act again. The CARES Act already made these facilities temporary. They were supposed to end at the end of the year. And of course, no change in law is ever permanent. Any future Congress can change it. Back in March, when this crisis hit, the Fed and Treasury knew that they needed to come to Congress for the tools to solve it. They came to Congress and we turned around in an extraordinarily rapid fashion these massive new facilities that had never been imagined before. We responded quickly. And if there's some kind of future event that calls for future set of facilities of, of this particular sort, they can come back to Congress. Mr. President, it's three facilities. Three facilities that are, were, were launched in conjunction with the CARES Act, funded by the CARES Act, and I'm saying they have achieved their purpose, they should come to an end, they should not be restarted, and a replica should not be created. That's all. Um, some have suggested that the chairman of the Federal Reserve is, has got some opinion on this. I would challenge anyone to find a statement in the public record that he has made in criticism of this. He's very well aware of what's going on. The last point I want to make, Mr. President. Some on the other side have suggested that our language is maybe too broad and maybe it captures potential facilities that shouldn't be captured. If, if that is the sincere concern of my colleagues on the other side, I urge them, give me a call. It's very easy to track me down. If you've got an objection to the way we've worded this and you want a la language that is narrower, I'm all ears. We, we could work this out. And with that, I yield the floor. All post closure time has expired. The question is on the DEEPS nomination.